Acts chapter 13 is uh, where we are here, session 23 of the pivot point, and uh, we're in the, the first, I'm calling it really the first apostolic journey, and the reason I'm doing that, normally we would call it the first missionary journey, but there are some things that Paul is able to do as an apostle that a missionary today is not able to do. And so I want to be careful not to uh, communicate that this is a missionary journey like any other missionary journey. Many of you have been on missionary journeys before or mission trips before. And of course, uh, uh, some of you uh, have been and some of you know those who have been missionaries of uh, their own right in this modern world. And there's a difference between a missionary and an apostle. So though Paul is doing a missions work and it really isn't a, an, an unbiblical or untheological thing to call this a missionary journey, I want to be a little more precise uh, tonight and call it uh, an, apo- an, an apostolic journey. And it really is the first apostolic journey uh, outside of the nation of Israel because Peter never went any farther than Caesarea or Samaria, never, never went out of the country in these apostolic journeys. And uh, uh, as far as the, the biblical record goes, we don't know of any of the other apostles going out. There's certainly some traditions as we have spoken of before. But through our journey, we've been looking at the decline of Israel and the rise then of what today we call the church and the church at Antioch has laid hands upon Paul and Barnabas as the Holy Spirit had given instruction and they sent them on their way in Acts chapter 13 verse 3. And so in verse 4 really is where our journey begins of this first apostolic journey and let's just start with verses 4 and 5. It says, so Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And then when they had reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John as their helper. Uh, I I want to break this journey up just in the cities in which they are. And here we have uh, the city, I I actually see a, a mistake that I made on the outline. I said the cities of Seleucia, Cyprus, and Salamis. Anybody know what my error is? Yeah, you do, don't you? Cyprus is not a city. Uh, Cyprus is an island. Uh, And uh, so it should be really the locales of Seleucia, Cyprus, and Salamis. Now, let's talk about these just a little bit. And uh, there's, there's honestly, if you love uh, uh, history, geography, and those kind of things, you could take these cities and you could begin to learn them and have all sorts of fun learning uh, really uh, ancient history uh, and uh, have a lot of fun with it. We'll just uh, mention a few things. But uh, Seleucia, in fact, I want to put up a map here of this uh, journey, uh, and we may refer to it once or twice. But uh, as you see on the map all the way over onto uh, the right side, I know that's a little bit difficult for you to see, but all the way over on the right side where that blue arrow comes out and that red arrow comes in, that is uh, the city of uh, Antioch and the red dot there. And on this map, the blue is going and the red is coming. So, uh, uh, and and the, the green happens to be John Mark who uh, quits and turns back and goes back home. So, they head out there from that red dot, which is Antioch, and then the little city of uh, Seleucia is right there on the coast. So uh, Seleucia, all they really did was pass through it. Uh, they, they went to Seleucia to get on a boat, no doubt. And uh, it's uh, a, a, um, a, a city that uh, today, if you went to, it'd just be overgrown in trees, not much there and named after, but it is not the seat of the Seleucid Empire, which was from Alexander the Great. So it's just named in his uh, behalf. And uh, uh, again, once a thriving city, but uh, not uh, anything there that you would go as a tourist today. And uh, going on then, they come then across the sea to that island there, which is Cyprus, south of what it would be modern day Turkey. And uh, Cyprus has a, a rich, vivid history, uh, long inhabited. 
uh, from really the earliest days of, uh, of, of human history. Uh, and it was, of course, under these uh, days, it was under the Roman Empire, under Roman control. Uh, after the Roman Empire divided in east and west, it came under the eastern portion of the Roman Empire long after Paul. And the eastern portion of the Roman Empire was uh, controlled by or also called the what empire? Uh, not quite Ottoman, but that was the one that took over. Byzantine. So uh, the Byzantine was the Eastern Roman Empire, and uh, it became part of the Byzantine Empire until uh, it uh, uh, came under the control of the Ottomans or the Turks in the year 1570 and uh, was uh, in, in some sort under the Turks uh, back and forth a little bit uh, with the uh, the the um, the, the, the England or the Brit British until 1914 when uh, the Ottoman Empire fell and it uh, became part of the British Empire and uh, became an independent republic in 1960. Now, isn't that fascinating? Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so here's this island. It is the island, by the way, uh, from which likely the Philistines came from. Yeah, you know, the Philistines, you remember the enemy, Goliath, uh, all that? The Philistines were known as the Sea People. And it is uh, the island that was called Katim in the Old Testament. You can look it up, Numbers 24. 24 is uh, one time that Katim is mentioned. And uh, if you begin to do some uh, study and some research, also there are the Hyksos rulers in Egypt, uh, foreign rulers, and uh, there's some... Uh, some some form of thinking that uh, believes they came from uh, Katim or this uh, island now of Crete as well. So here's a place that back in the ancient world in Paul's day, if you wanted to go someplace as a, uh, 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 to, to see uh, ancient ruins and everything else and all sorts of uh, history, archaeology, it would have been a great place to be. And he uh, he went here. It was a place that uh, had a, a lot of Jewish people in it as well, as we'll see from the city of Salamis. Now, uh, you can't see it very well on the map, but right where that first blue arrow hits the island, there on the coast is the city of Salamis. And so it would have been the port city and a very prominent city. It was not the seat of government at Paul's time, but had been the seat of government in uh, recent past, even in Roman days. And the Romans uh, uh, took Crete about 58 B.C., and a uh, city of wealth down through its uh, years. And in fact, for about uh, 600 years, even after Paul, it was a wealthy, prominent city. But uh, through an uh, invasion, at one invasion after another, they uh, held firm. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, finally just uh, lost its prominence, uh, having too many invasions coming to take care of it. And uh, tradition says that Barnabas was stoned to death here in 61. We don't know that from the Bible, but that's what tradition says. And here Barnabas uh, shows up, Barnabas and Saul. So now getting back to our scripture, uh, they went down to Seleucia, from Antioch down to Seleucia, where they got on the boat and they sailed to Cyprus and they arrived at Salamis and they began to proclaim the word of God, where? In the synagogues, the synagogues of the Jews. They're the only ones that have synagogues, by the way. And they had John as their helper. Remember which John this is? He's also known as Mark, John Mark. So here he is. Now, they come to the uh, to to the synagogues. There were no doubt. Uh, notice it's in plural, and there were a lot of a uh, lot of Jews there on the island. In fact, uh, there it, there was a war in the year 115 to 117, the Kedus War, and uh, it was a Jewish rebellion. It was centered in uh, in in, in uh, Cyprus and in Crete, and. It uh, on on the island of Cyprus, 240,000 people were killed in that short war, 115 to 117, and all a part of uh, the whole Jewish rebellion that took place all through those years up through 135 A.D. And so lots of Jews and lots of faithful, committed Zionist kinds of Jews that uh, were living there. Uh, so he comes to the synagogue. Now, I want to, to uh, think about that for just a moment, because if you were to do a little word study on the synagogue, uh, you would find just in a, in, a, in a count study, you would find that this synagogue, of course, is used quite often in the New Testament. And no doubt you've 
seen it quite often, right? And yet, if you were to follow along, you would find that from here on out, uh, just a few uh, chapters in, uh, let's say from the book of Acts uh, on out, it just totally drops off the map. You can read every one of Paul's works and never, 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 never read about a synagogue. Why not? He's not the apostle to the Jews. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. So he goes to synagogues. He's even going to go to synagogues all the way through the end of the book. And, and the writing that he is going to do, the book of Romans, all that, is going to take place in the time that we're reading of the history here. But he is very much a, 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 an ambassador or, or a, an apostle to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. And so it uh, wouldn't make sense in his writing that he talks about the synagogues. There's three times, by the way, after the book of Acts, uh, 56 times altogether, you see the word synagogue, three times after the book of Acts. And one is used by James, of course, the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And uh, we often uh, translate that, typically not even translated synagogue in your English, though it's the, it's, it's the word synagogue. And it's uh, in, the, in the passage of Scripture in James chapter 1 that talks about when you come into the assembly and there is a rich man that comes in and uh, you give him the prominent seat in the house and then another poor man comes in and you set him in the back. Now, that word assembly there is not ecclesia or church, but rather it's synagogue. And of course, James, that would have been his, uh, his, his context uh, at the time he wrote that, writing to saved Jewish uh, believers that would have been meeting in their synagogue. The other two times is in the book of Revelation, and it's not even used in, uh, in, in, a, in a literal sense. It's used in a metaphorical sense, talking about the synagogue of Satan. And uh, so the New Testament is not about synagogues. The New Testament is about church. So here he comes and he is in the synagogue. Now the question is going to be, uh, is he going to preach the same message to these Jews in the synagogue that Peter preached in uh, Acts chapter 2 to those Jews meeting in the upper room? Now, if you take the standard line of teaching that's given usually in churches, of course, the answer is going to be, why, yes, he's going to teach the message, the same message. In fact, there's only one gospel. What else could he do? It would be heresy to think of anything else, right? But you've sat through 23 sessions of the teaching of the book of Acts. So you're suspicious and you're wondering, I wonder what's going to happen here as Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle of the mystery, the apostle of grace, not of law, comes in, the apostle of a new dispensation. Is he going to come in and preach the same message that was preached prior to this, uh, this dispensation? Well, we'll take a look at that. And we will begin to see. So uh, here he comes and he begins to preach to them, to the Jew first, as uh, we talked about last week. Now, we pick up uh, in the uh, city of Paphos as we continue on in verse 6. It says, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, uh, our... Uh, uh, our map just disappeared. Sorry, I didn't catch that quick enough. But uh, on the uh, uh, on the map, uh, you see there uh, that blue arrow cuts across the island. So we have Salamis on the right side or the east side of the island, and Paphos is all the way across. So just as it's described here in verse 6, as we can get back to the scripture now, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos. And uh, it was the uh, city, the Greek mythologists uh, said that the goddess Aphrodite came up out of the water at Paphos. And so there was a huge temple to her, the, uh, the, the foundations of which are visible even to this day. And uh, as uh, we continue, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. Bar-Jesus. What does Bar-Jesus mean? The son of Jesus, in a sense. Um, but if you translate Jesus, Jesus uh, translated in, in, uh, in Hebrew, Yeshua, or in Greek, uh, Jesus, translated means what? Uh, savior. So son of, the, son of the Savior, basically, is, uh, is, is the translation here. This is his name. Uh, he is the son of the Savior. So uh, verse 7 uh, he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. You like him already, don't you? Uh, now, 
just to uh, help you get this uh, together, the proconsul was appointed in this case, it would vary just a slightly depending on where you were, but in this case, he was appointed by the Roman Senate. Uh, obviously, he was then a man of notoriety. He's one of these that we might call the Honorable Sergius Paulus uh, because of his position. So he was the proconsul, we would call him today the governor. And uh, his name is Sergius Paulus. If you look uh, and do a little historical work on Sergius Paulus, as Josh has done, you would find that uh, in the year uh, 47 AD, there was a stone erected in the city of Rome that uh, was erected to the uh, notoriety of a fellow named uh, Sergius Paulus. And uh, he, he was the, uh, uh, help me with the word, Josh, he's the Curator, thank you. I was thinking museums. I knew it would come to me eventually, but uh, he was the curator, uh, mentioned as a curator there. Now, here's, I, I'm, I'm going to give a scenario. I don't really know what happened. Uh, but the scenario is we're probably 45 or 46 AD here at this point. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the proconsulship was only for a year if you're reelected, so to speak, by the Senate, maybe another year. And so he spends a year, he spends a two, two years here, he goes back to Rome, and uh, he is uh, uh, set then as the curator. And then there are a number of Roman senators then after that point, and fitting in even with the timing, named Sergius Paulus. Now there's six of them, and probably all of them of the same family, certainly not all of them the same men, but maybe Sergius Paulus, who's about to be converted here and become a Christian, maybe he goes on to a prominent position in Rome and he goes on to a prominent position then even in the Senate. If that's true, and even if it's not true, we know he's a prominent man. I mean, if, the, if, if a former governor came here today, we, we would probably make note of it, right? Like we have Governor what, hog, um, in the audience today, and we're delighted, whatever it may be. So we would make note of it, even if they had gone off into, into oblivion, as governors tend to do, and typically we hope so. So the, here, here's a man who would have been prominent. Now, why do I mention this later on? Obviously, he would have been prominent. He becomes a believer here. And uh, he... Uh, uh, likely moves to, to Rome. It, everything looks like all roads lead to Rome. It appears that he uh, moved to Rome. And later on, Paul is going to write a letter to the Romans, right? And as Paul often does, when he closes out his letter to the Romans, he says, now you greet this person and that person. I want you to tell this person uh, hello for me and I'll, you know how it ends. And yet at Romans, he doesn't say anything about Sergius Paulus. Now, if Sergius Paulus is a believer and he became a curator of a, an area and he became a, even a senator, this would be maybe the most prominent of all uh, converts, all believers in Rome. Now, obviously, from there, you can make up all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, and I would uh, hesitate from doing so. But here's the most likely scenario. By the time Paul writes the book of Romans, which is late 50s, uh, let's say 10, 11 years from here, the, uh, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't mention this guy. I suppose this guy's dead by then uh, from whatever reason. Uh, now, if I were writing a movie, I would make it very exciting, uh, but he might have you know, died from a sudden heart attack or something, uh, ate too many uh, Roman pizzas. I don't know what Romans eat. Uh, so here's this guy. Sergius Paulus, a, a, a proconsul, a man of intelligence, a man of intelligence. This is the, there, there are five words in the, in the Greek language for intelligence, and this is the one that is the intelligence that comes from the five senses. That is, you sniff it out, you look it over, you listen close, uh, you, 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 you touch it, and uh, you smell, uh, what is, uh, did I get all of them? You, you taste it. I think I missed taste. <laughs> uh, you'd, you'd use your five senses nonetheless. And uh, it, you, you, might even, you might even say, we might say he learned through the school of hard knocks. That is, he experienced, and because of his experience, he was pretty knowledgeable. One of my favorite quotes is this, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. <laughs> uh, you know, someone else ever comes to you and says, boy, that was an experience. <laughs> 
That means that it didn't turn out quite like they wanted, but they got some experience on it. Now, here when it says he was a man of intelligence, it says this is a guy who's going to listen, he's going to look, he's going to smell it, he's going to taste it, he's going to touch it, he's going to try to figure out what this is. And if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and all this kind of stuff, he's going to say, you know what, this must be a duck. This is the kind of thinker that he is. Now, I think, by the way, that if the Christian faith is done correctly, if it's taught correctly, that uh, this is one of the uh, greatest areas of, uh, of, of, of witness, uh, greatest mission fields that we can give because the Word of God uh, taught logically makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's not this blind faith, just sort of feel it and go with the flow and whatnot. And I think we teach it too much that way in sort of a mystical kind of way. And so people of intelligence in our world are not known for desiring to have preachers come talk to them, right? But, uh, uh, and often, you know, well, religion is just a crutch for the weak, right? And uh, those who know better, uh, those who are men of intelligence, they're going to deny it. Well, I think Paul was the kind of person that, uh, that, that this man of intelligence was interested in hearing. Barnabas uh, must have been as well because they are summoned to Barnabas and Saul. Continuing on verse 7, the man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the, the magician, and so his name is tra- for so his name is translated... Uh, Elemus means uh, wise or sage or the knowing one. Isn't this interesting? You've got a man of intelligence who has one of his right-hand men who's known as the sage. You wise one. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the message, which is not a Bible, uh, translates this, uh, old doctor know-it-all. Doctor know-it-all. Uh, instead of Elemis. That's because the message likes to make things sound funny. Uh, this is Dr. Know-it-all, so it says in English. Uh, so we'd say in English is what the message says. But his name was, was, uh, was Bar-Jesus. That's his Jewish name. He's going by Elemis here, which is actually a, an Arabic name. And I'm not sure exactly what all is behind there. So this, 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 this one who is supposed to be wise and, and knowing, and uh, he is a magician, a false Jewish prophet, Uh, He was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. We've got things a little backwards here, don't we? That the uh, Jew is supposed to be the one who uh, loves God and remembers God in all things and uh, loves the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and uh, strength and uh, loves your neighbor as yourself. But here's the Jew who's saying, let's, let's, let's not get into these spiritual things. Let's not get into these faith things. And he's trying to turn him away. Verse 9, but, but Saul, who is also known as Paul. You know, right here we make a transition and from here on out we're going to be Paul. And this is all we've got. Saul who is also known as Paul. Don't you want some sort of story in here that God came and um, changed his name and everything was different from this uh, this point on? And we, you know, we've got it with uh, Jacob who became Israel and Simon who became Peter and God changed the names. Honestly, we don't have that with Paul. We know that he was called Saul all this time. Now he's called Paul. And uh, uh, there are a couple of different uh, ideas on why he's called Paul from this point on. Uh, some say he was always called Paul. And honestly, the, the, the scripture goes, uh, let me say that different. He was always called Saul or Paul, just depending on, on uh, who he was, you know, how, how, you, how you knew him. And some people called him Saul. Some people called him Paul. He was the same person. And uh, this, was, this was known. Now, that does appear to be how the text is. And that would not have been uncommon. Saul in his Jewish world, Paul in his, uh, in his uh, Hellenized or Gentile or Greek world, and this is what he calls. There's another line of thinking that uh, could also have some truth to, to it because it uh, was not terribly uncommon in the world, in that world, that uh, one who had done a, a, a very wonderful thing for you and especially who provided for you in financial ways, you might take on their name. Well, here we're talking about a guy who's about to be converted, who's very prominent, and his name is what? Paulus, uh, Paul for short, and uh, it, it very well may be that Paulus, 
his most uh, uh, notorious in a positive sense uh, convert also helped him out a lot financially. And maybe in honor of that, he is taking on his name. Now, I don't know if that's true. All I know is that his name is Saul and he's also known as Paul. How's that? Uh, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Literally, it says, having been filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 here's, I, well, let me say this. I don't know, but here's what I think. How's this? Uh, I don't know when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, how all that worked. But I do know that when Ananias came from the, to the street called Straight, you remember? Ananias prayed, laid hands upon him, and he received what? The Holy Spirit. Now, my hunch here, though the grammar doesn't require this, uh, but it certainly allows this. My hunch is that that is what it's talking about here when it says filled with the Holy Spirit, because it does not say he was filled with the Holy Spirit for this particular incident, though that may be what it what it, grammatically it could be that. But grammatically, what it really says is having been filled with the Holy Spirit fixed his gaze upon him. Now, having been filled with the Holy Spirit easily could have been from the days of his salvation a, a, a number of years ago. So he uh, fixed his gaze upon him. This is Paul. And he said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? He's kind of a timid pastor. <laughs> That's uh, about, uh, uh, about as strong as goat's breath, isn't it? Uh, to have a guy look at you in the eye and, and no doubt in front of your boss here, Sergius Paulus, and uh, bring this up. You're full of deceit and fraud. Well, we know that earlier. He's a what kind of a prophet? A false prophet, full of deceit and fraud. You son of the devil. That's a play on words, isn't it? Because what's his name? Son of the Savior. You're no son of the Savior. You're a son of the devil. That's what you are. You enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, he goes on in verse 11. The hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and not see. How long? Not see the sun. What? For a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. And in verse 12, then the proconsul believed what he saw, uh, believed when he saw what happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now, I think that uh, we have here in the characters of this story, we have a little bit of uh, significance. It's certainly a literal story, but I think there is a possible spiritual meaning that is given here. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, again, want to build some sort of doctrine on this because it's not uh, completely stated in the text. But here is a, 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 a picture that is, in a sense, I, I think we could say a type. Uh, it's a typical story. I don't mean typical in the English way, but in the theological way, that it is shadowing something else. And here we've got the Gentile... Uh, getting saved and the Jew being blinded and he's being blinded for a time, right? He's going to see the, the sun, the light of the sun again. And uh, I think there's some, some picture here, but what, uh, uh, what uh, at least there's, there's some uh, uh, coincidence, if nothing else, that this is what God is doing to the Gentiles. Excuse me. Uh, he's doing this new work in the Gentiles where there was a hunger in the Gentiles and the Gentiles, as Paul said, I'm going to have to paraphrase it, uh, but uh, Paul says to the Romans, he says, the Gentiles who weren't seeking the things of righteousness found it. But the Jews who were seeking didn't find it. And uh, then as uh, it continues on, uh, what uh, does Paul say in Romans chapter 11? I believe it's verse 25 says that there is a, a hardening of the heart for I do not want you brethren to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own es estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the time until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all of Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come forth from Zion. Now, do you notice, uh, notice that? It is a, a, a partial hardening that happens till when? 
till the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That is, are the Jewish people, is the Jewish nation hardened forever? No. Uh, they're blinded. Are they blinded forever? No. And uh, it's a temporary thing, and it's going to be removed. And someday that hard heart will be a uh, soft heart, and their blindness will be given away to sight. So here, perhaps, is this little picture. And so this proconsul, Sergius Paulus, believes uh, when he saw what had happened, and he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. A beautiful story there, no doubt. Now let's continue to go on, and we see uh, per Perga and uh, Pam in, in Pamphylia and also Pisidian Antioch, uh, beginning in verse 13. As it says, now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch. Now let's look at our map here once again and try to get our uh, bearings if we can as they uh, made it from Antioch all the way over on the right and hit the island on the eastern side and uh, crossed all the way to, uh, to Paphos. And then you see the blue arrow going up there and uh, that goes up to uh, Perga and uh, that is in Pamphylia. Pamphylia is the region or the state that it was in. And uh, there John turns around uh, and that green arrow there, he goes back to Jerusalem. Now, we'll meet up with him later, and when we do, we'll talk a little more about all this incident because the Scripture gives us some more insight later. And then they go on up uh, in that continued blue arrow on the land there. They go up on uh, to... Uh, to Antioch, but this is a different Antioch than the one they came from, obviously. It is Antioch in Pisidia, thus it's called Pisidian Antioch. Uh, so back to uh, the scripture then. It says that on the Sabbath day, they went down into the synagogue to the Jew first and sat down. And verse 15, after reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. There must have been some prominence already of Barnabas and Saul. And uh, there certainly was an openness in the synagogue to this kind of thing. There was a time and opportunity for this kind of thing. And uh, here the, uh, the synagogue officials were uh, saying, hey, you, you guys want to say anything? Now we've read the law, we've read the prophets. And so verse 16, here's the sermon. Now this gets into the question we asked earlier. When Paul's in the synagogue, is he going to preach the same message that Peter preached? And uh, let's watch it and see. So verse 16, Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now, now you might notice already that he said something different than what Peter said, right? We could go back and compare it closely in Acts chapter 2, but uh, very clearly Peter's message was only to Israel. Here he says, men of Israel and you who fear God. Now that phrase we're going to come up with uh, in a bad translation later if we get that far, but uh, uh, you who fear God, it literally is, uh, 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 I hope I have all my grammar correct here, but phobios tatheos, uh, the, 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 the ones who have a phobia of God. And uh, in used phobia used in a very uh, positive sense here. They were God fearers. God fearers were not Jews. They were Gentiles. God fearers were not converted. That is, they had not been proselytized. They, 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 they went to the synagogue very often. They believed in the God of Israel. They loved the prophets. They were Zionists, perhaps. All of these uh, things, but they were Gentiles, not Jews. Now, had they converted, they wouldn't be called God-fearers. Had they converted, they would be called what? Jews. Uh, because it doesn't matter that uh, you're of a Gentile nature. If you convert to Judaism, you are fully and completely a Jew. In fact, in modern Judaism, the, you're, you're, you're at the highest rank of Judaism. They, uh, they, they honor that uh, very strongly and very completely. So these are, these are men, uh, or, or women, I suppose, who uh, do not, uh, they're, they're, they're not Jewish, they're Gentile, even though there is a respect for the Jewish faith. So he's speaking to Jews and to Gentiles. This is new. Verse 17, 
the God of this people, Israel, uh, he's, he specifies that. Which, which God are we talking about? The God of the Israel people, not of you God-fearers. Uh, you got uh, the, the Gentiles had all sorts of gods. But the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. With an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. And verse 18, for a period of about 40 years, what did he do? He put up with them in the wilderness, put up with them in the wilderness. I've given you the Greek word uh, there that it, uh, it literally means a, uh, a manner or a way of life to carry. Uh, so he carried their way of life. Uh, King James says it well when he suffered, them, he, he suffered, uh, su- suffered he their manners. Uh, through the through the 40 years in the wilderness. Now, the message totally messed it up when it said he took good care of them for nearly 40 years. Uh, it, it, uh, it misses the, the, the clear, not even nuance of the word, but the clear meaning of that word that I think New American Standard did it well. He put up with them. He suffered their manners for 40 years in the wilderness. And here is the, the uh, story that is given. Now, nobody denies that, uh, do they? All you got to do again is read the book of Numbers. So verse 19, when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. How did Paul know it was seven nations? Because the scripture told him, actually, uh, you didn't have to be filled with the Holy Spirit or inspired or anything else to know. All you had to do is read Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, uh, let's see, chapter 7, verse 1. And uh, there they are, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And the scripture says, these are seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And God set these aside. So what he's doing is just rehearsing, if you will, a little bit of Old Testament history. Did, uh, did the Hebrew scriptures tell the Hebrew people that God uh, suffered their manners for 40 years? Is that, any, is that a new surprise to them if they had read the scriptures? No, remember the word stiff-necked? That comes all the way through the Old Testament. So he is, he's rehearsing, much as Peter and much as Stephen did here. And uh, here's the seven nations that were destroyed. Uh, now, uh, careful if you've got the New American Standard here as we continue. It uh, says that when he had destroyed, he distributed their land as an in- inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Now, the way that reads is it took him 450 years to distribute the land, and then after that, he gave him judges, Right? But that would completely mess up your timeline. If you look in the King James Version, it'll uh, line that out for you a little bit. And uh, the point is that uh, as, as he began to uh, distribute their land to them, that is at the time of conquest, there were 450 years then, uh, as, uh, uh, excuse me, about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. On another day, we could look at the chronology of that. But uh, verse 21, then they ask, then they ask for a king. So they've had judges. They've been under a theocracy, but they reject the theocracy and say, we want a monarchy. Now, the bad part about that is uh, theocracy is led by God, right? So here's Theo talking about it. And what does he say? They've not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me, God, God says. So. Uh, they, they asked for a king, verse 21, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And after he had removed him, uh, and he gave him 40 years to show that he was a miserable failure, but after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. And from the descendants of this man, which man? David, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. After John, this is the Baptist, after John had proclaimed before his coming, Jesus is coming, a baptism of repentance to the people of Israel. What did John proclaim? A baptism of repentance to the people of Israel. Put that in the back of your head. And while John was contemplating his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he, but behold, one is coming after me. The sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, 
sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God to us. The message of this salvation has been sent for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which they read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And verse 28, though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate to be uh, for, that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. Notice that verse again. When they had carried out what? All that was written concerning him. Now, in the context, what are we talking about that was written concerning him? The cross. The cross is no surprise, was it? It was no mystery that Jesus was going to die on the cross. So they carried out all that was written, took him down, laid him in a tomb. That's all in the book of Psalms. But... God raised him from the dead. Was that a surprise to anybody if you knew the Old Testament well? No. We're going to see that he's going to lay that case in a moment. Uh, in verse 31, And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. Uh, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. Now let's stop right there. Uh, especially had I not read verse 31, does that sound an awful lot like the messages that uh, Peter has preached and Stephen has preached, sort of rehearsing Israel's history? It really does, doesn't it? And uh, here's what, what, what happened, and he brings it all along. And uh, uh, the, the, the Savior came, whom you crucified, but God raised him up, Peter says, and this is the same picture that is given here. And uh, he was raised up. He appeared. Peter says the same thing. And then notice verse 32 again. Don't uh, take this wrong because we tend to. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. Now, some of you are saying, aha, see there, the, 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 the gospel uh, was promised to the fathers all along and now it has come. And uh, the, the, the Old Testament always said the time of the gospel would come. But... This good news of the promise made to the fathers is that promise, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we, we preach here. No, C keep going. But let's read it again. The good news of the promise. Now, our question is, what's the promise? He answers it in verse 33, that God has fulfilled this. New American Standard adds the word promise. You notice that? God has fulfilled this promise. It's the same promise. And so Paul says, I got good news. Promise God gave to the fathers. God fulfilled it. He has fulfilled this to our children in that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And uh, what, what Paul is preaching here is uh, fellas, Jews, and God-fearers, let me tell you what happened. God did this, 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 brought about finally Jesus. Uh, we crucified him, just like the scripture said we were going to. Uh, put him in a tomb, borrowed tomb, tomb of a rich man, just like the scripture said we were going to. He was raised again on the third day, just like the scripture said he was going to. God has fulfilled those promises, and that's good news. It would be bad news if God didn't fulfill any of his promises, right? So this is especially good news related to this promise. So God has, uh, ha has uh, raised him from the dead. This is good news. Going on in verse 34, he continues to nail home the fact that Christ is raised from the dead. This is his, uh, his important promise here. And he wants these people to know Christ is risen. Verse 34, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, he said. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. This is uh, Psalm 22, I believe, but it may be Psalm 69. Uh, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. Now, the question is, who's his holy one? You might say, well, it's David. And he was afraid you might say it's David. And so he addresses that in verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among the fathers. And what happened to him? Underwent decay. Have I mentioned that I'm going to Israel this December? 
I wasn't sure if I had or not, but uh, uh, I'm just sure that uh, as we're there, we'll stop in Jerusalem one day and uh, we'll go up, uh, over to the upper room and uh, there on Mount Zion and uh, we'll go down into this uh, place and I'm going to say, well, we're going to see the tomb of David. And you're going to say, oh, the tomb of David. I'm excited. I didn't know there was a tomb of David. And uh, you're going to walk in uh, this little uh, nondescript room and you're going to see uh, uh, bare wires hanging and a bare light bulb. And you're going to put on a little uh, uh, yarmulke, paper one perhaps, uh, that's there. And you're going to walk in and in about uh, 30 seconds, you're going to walk out and you're going to say, Hmm. That's it, huh? <laughs> That's the tomb of David. Not what I was expecting when you said we were going to see the tomb of David. Now, uh, I don't know even if David's in that coffin. I have no clue. But I do know that David's bones are somewhere. <laughs> He died. There's not a Jew anywhere that says David's alive today, that he raised, was, was raised. They would all say, though this was written by David and David says, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Every single Jew who's a, 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 a Jew of any worth at all says, that's not about David. That's the Messiah. That's what Paul's saying. Yeah, it's not about David. It's about the Messiah. And the Messiah is Jesus. Continuing verse 36, uh, no, excuse me, um, verse 37. He underwent decay, but he whom God raised did not undergo decay. He already told us who God raised, and uh, he told us that uh, back in uh, verse 30, uh, and that was Jesus. Therefore, verse 38, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, the risen Christ, Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Does that sound like anything Peter preached? Uh, Peter preached a message of condemnation, didn't he? And uh, it was a message of repent, repent uh, uh, to, to Israel. Now, Israel didn't repent. They rejected that as we've gone through so many times. But here comes Paul, and he is preaching, and it sure looks to me like he's preaching a message of grace, doesn't it? Like, like we've got a new dispensation that has come along. Therefore, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, he, he says, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, verse 39, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Now, try all you want. You'll have to do uh, some sort of linguistic gymnastics to get Peter to say that because Peter doesn't say that. And uh, Peter encourages them to live under the law. Uh, Peter himself lived under the law. And when God uh, told him about what we decide, uh, uh, eight, ten years later, when God said, uh, uh, take and eat, Peter said, seven years. Thank you. Peter said, no, I won't do that. Never. I live according to the law. So you won't find Peter saying of that from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Verse 40 Therefore, since this message of uh, forgiveness is proclaimed now, therefore take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers. He mentions from Haggai chapter one, verse five. Behold, you scoffers, marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Now, don't don't read that on the wrong side, uh, because you might you might say there is uh, th there's evidence that God was going to send this mysterious gospel in which there was neither Jew nor Greek. But uh, God does not counting the trespasses of the world against them that uh, they have been uh, forgiven and they never would have believed that even though someone told it to them. Because when you take Haggai one five in context, it's a message of judgment. It's much like the message that the writer of the book of Hebrews says when he says how shall we escape if we, what? Neglect so great a salvation. And here's, what, here, here's the warning that comes here along with the good news. And uh, the warning is uh, this, you know, be careful. Read, read Haggai 1 uh, verse 5. 
that comes to us. And I think what we've got is a new dispensation and a new message. And uh, let's, uh, it is uh, quitting time here. Uh, but let's uh, just read uh, very quickly verses 42 and 43. It says, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the what? God-fearing proselytes is what New American Standard says. The problem is there's no such thing as a God-fearing proselyte. Remember I told you that earlier? That God-fearers were not proselytes. Phobia ta theos, the people who had a fear of God, were never proselytes. If you became a proselyte, you weren't a God-fearer. You were a Jew. So why here does it say God-fearing proselytes? Because the translator didn't do their homework here. Because it doesn't say phobia ta theos, uh, fearer of God. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the word that is used here is actually just the word devout. So what it should say, and I believe uh, King James has this correctly, many of the Jews and the devout proselytes or the worshiping proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. In fact, uh, if uh, we were to, if I had uh, a reference... Religious proselytes, that's, uh, that's a good word. Uh, worshiping, devout, uh, religious, somewhere before the chapter is out, and I, uh, uh, I've uh, missed it here, but it's going to talk about how, uh, here it is, uh, verse 50. Uh, but the Jews incited the what? The devout women of prominence. Same word uh, that's used uh, in verse 43. So, these are devout. Don't, don't put God-fearing, though uh, 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 they, they may be. Uh, but the, the reason not to do that is because that particular phrase means not a proselyte. So they're religious proselytes, devout. They, they, uh, they really mean it. And they are saying, we want more. We want more. Come back next week and you'll hear more. That's what they're saying. Which is what you're saying too, right? Uh, we'll finish this out. In fact, we'll pick up uh, next week in verse 42 and see this crowd's response. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for uh, this message of Paul that we are able to proclaim as well. And that is this message of forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins uh, is proclaimed. I'm grateful that it has been proclaimed to those in this audience. I'm grateful that we're able to go from here and proclaim forgiveness, the forgiveness that has come through Jesus Christ and through uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that we never could have achieved through the law. And uh, I'm grateful that in grace, you have allowed us to experience it, even though Israel rejected. And I'm grateful that the rejection of Israel became the reconciliation of the world and this age of grace. For this, I celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen.